The collapse of crypto giant FTX is not only one of the biggest cases of fraud in U.S. history, but with each passing day, the scandal reveals a disturbing web of connections at the highest levels of politics, finance, government, even sports. Of note, disgraced FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried mingled and drew the support of some of the most powerful leaders around the world. In fact, he donated close to $40 million to the Democratic Party during the midterm elections. That is only second behind mega donor George Soros. To help make sense of what happened and what may be to come is former Lazard managing director and author of Why America Matters, the case for a new exceptionalism, Michael Wilkerson. And Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Allison, great to be here with you. I appreciate it. How can you describe what happened here? Yeah, I was going to say, I've been thinking about the analogy for those who aren't super literate or, or involved in the crypto world. It's a pretty simple one, which is this is like the equivalent bank run where depositors get wind of something bad that happens. They all uh, run to the run to the bank, want all their money out at the same time, able to provide for all those depositor withdrawals. Now, why did that bank run happen in this case? Uh, you can, again, use the same analogy. Imagine that a bank where your money, your life savings, valuable things into this bank under an agreement deposits were going to be taken care of, that you were going to earn interest, that they might be put into certain things, allowed activities, maybe loans or otherwise. But instead, that bank took all of your deposits, moved them over to a related sister company owned by the same person, and then used your funds to trading losses that had or that had occurred months before where there was this sort of avalanche of of losses that kept growing and growing and growing from earlier in the year to such a point when they could no longer cover it anymore so what happened here was an intrepid independent journalist did some work realized and by the way one of the nice things about the crypto industry is every transaction is visible to anyone because it's all recorded on a blockchain so whether you or involved in not, you can go and look. And this, this journalist did and discovered that there were these very suspicious trades going back and forth between FTX and a related company called Alameda Research, which was a, a hedge fund, the trading arm. And as I just described, I think what is pretty clear now is that FTX was taking customers from FTX and moving it over to Alameda Research and using it to shore up these losses. And as soon as depositors figured this out, then they all ran for the exits, ran for the doors, took their whatever tokens out they could from FTX, which then precipitated an almost immediate and total collapse of FTX. That's what happened. There's a lot of questions around why and how and uh, to what end, but, but that's roughly the sequence of events. But what about the connections in terms of the, these were the FTX was no small fry. I mean, they were really like a golden child in the crypto industry. And you had so many big names and then there were the politicians who were attached to it. That's a whole other dimension. So he gave so much money to politicians. How can we not take a look at, at that? We have to. This is going to turn out to be one of the most bizarre frauds that we've ever seen. Just by the way, by magnitude. Okay, we, we think I keep, there are different figures that keep coming out. $10 billion, and I've heard up to $16 billion of client funds that were misappropriated, misapplied, some of which have been recovered, some of which have not, most, most of which have not. Let's put that in context. Bernie Madoff's total fraud, $18 billion. Enron, WorldCom. Uh, Theranos, think about other, those were in, in energy bombs and biotech. It has nothing to do with crypto per se. Frauds are frauds, but this one unfortunately goes into that scale of massive, like largest frauds of all time. Now, to your point, the story starts to get bizarre because Sam Bankman Fried was absolutely the poster child of, uh, well, the Democratic Party, of the elites of the party. The face of crypto I didn't give him that recognition. He gave it to himself and the political class gave it to him. He was off in DC all the time proposing, how do we, how do we regulate crypto? How do we do this or that? He'd get a lot of backlash in the industry. But layers here are so deep that I think it's going to take a while. He was called Morgan of the 21st century because he, earlier in the year, had been other failing crypto platforms which again, uh, some of the in, in the political elites were pushing for him to do as sort of this savior rescuer of these other platforms, which of course is what got him in trouble because those were some of the problems where some of the problems originated that he had later. 
the donations that he was making, and I, it's still, uh, as far as I know, confirmed to be true, just a donor to the Democratic Party behind George Soros. Interesting crowd to be in. Um, he says that he did give uh, monies on the Republican side as well. Uh, buttering his bread on both sides of the aisle, so to speak, to make sure that whoever was in power in coming years was going to be favorable to him. And you see it, it's it, it, really the reaction that is still so visible, tells us that there is some sort of favorable treatment going on here. But what's peculiar about this is that no one is, and including the media, really taking a look at this. It's not, it's not a big deal. I mean, I remember when the Madoff situation went down and all of those people showed up to the lipstick building in Midtown and were like, they were going crazy. Where's my money? Where's my money? SBF's hanging out in the Bahamas and he's kind of like, oops, I made a mistake. And nobody's asking him questions. And then he shows up at this New York Times meeting and people are applauding him. I I, I, I was stunned. I uh, So I, I used this on another interview, but I said it, it reminds me of the song when I was growing up by The Verve called The Freshman, where the line goes something like, you know, we can't be held responsible. We were only freshmen. You know, I, I was just a kid. Don't blame me. And he's definitely taking that, uh, you know, prep school student going into the headmaster approach here of like, yeah, boy, that was really dumb. I'm so sorry. I think that works in prep school. I'm not sure it works uh, when you've committed a $12 billion fraud. This was not just bad business judgment. Okay. This was fraud. Now, fraud's difficult to prove. You got to show intent. You got to show a lot of things. But you know it when you see it. It's pretty clear what was going on here was that was very fraudulent. An interesting question would be, uh, yes, he did g give money to Democrats and Republicans, but obviously it was a huge amount of money to Democrats. And the, I think the question needs to be asked, if it was reverse and $40 million was given to the Republicans during the midterms, would everybody be zeroing in on this story. Yeah, I think you'd be getting a very different reaction at the time at, this, at that in that event, instead of protecting him and sort of coddling him and in, in, in the narrative and giving him the benefit of the doubt, of course, there would be a very much more excoriating response. Think about a year or so it happened. He went out, raised money, several hundred million dollars on a $32 billion valuation. Okay, this is incredible. Now, instead of putting that money into the business, it appears that not only did he give a lot of it away, this isn't a lot off the table for himself, some of which they may be able to recover, some of which they won't. But he was very, very generous with money, I think. And what's going to be uh, likely is that it will be around that issue where investors say, you violated the investor investment agreement. You went way beyond what you should have done. Um, investors will will not take as kind of a view, I don't believe, as the media and the political class here uh, when it comes down to the fact that they've lost tens or millions of dollars. I do remember him testifying. I don't know if it was last spring. Was that the House Financial Committee? That yeah. he would, they, were, they had like six or maybe I think it was six heads of the major crypto companies. And he was right up there. And I think at the time I was just trying to understand what he was saying, but he was one of the main players. He was one of the main players lecturing them about the causes of the financial crisis of 2008. Um, in terms of the mortgage markets, fraud that had gone on there in, in mortgage-backed securities. Thing. And then within a few months, it turns out he's doing the exact type of thing. I have to go back and look at that video, but I I'm, I always remember walking away from that video and thinking, I think SPF's like shoes are untied. Like you could <laughs> see his feet like dangling, you know, when he's talking to everyone in the dais. And I'm like, who's this kid with his shoes are untied and he's worth billions of dollars. It was, it was very surreal. And then I'm like, oh, that's the guy. That's right. How so, much of that was uh, constructed theater was really who he is, I, I don't know. But there's a little yeah. book, I think. He's certainly trying to play it up right now. It's like, uh, again, I was just this helpless kid, didn't know what I was doing, was given uh, too big a responsibility, and I made some mistakes. Mistakes were made. <laughs> and I, I don't know what the ties to Ukraine are or if that has been verified. I don't want to talk about rumor or do you know anything in, I'm hearing respect. the same things that you are. So so right now it's uh, just information that's floating out there. There is a lot of evidence that uh, there has been a lot of money that has flown into Ukraine uh, through uh, crypto. 
Now, what's distressing is you're seeing reports in the last couple of weeks that a lot of that funding and a lot of the armaments that have been moving from the West, from the U.S. and, and, and Europe into the Ukraine are not staying in Ukraine. Um, there are reports, in fact, the uh, prime minister of Nigeria came out uh, a few days ago, basically sounding the alarm, saying, hey, a lot of those small arms uh, are, are moving into uh, northern Nigeria, where we're already having some really big problems. Get a handle on it, folks. Uh, it's not just there, but through other parts of, uh, of the Middle East as well. So what's happening in Ukraine, whether it be in the form of crypto arms or, or, or cash dollars, uh, is not all ending up where it should be. There is a lot of face. And unfortunately, I think we're going to see even some of the more advanced weapons, not just uh, rifles and small arms things ending up in very bad hands. And that's a concern that I think ultimately there is going to be some link to FDX and other crypto platforms. Well, who is responsible for investigating that? Well, that's a great question. Uh, it should be the uh, both should be the donor and the recipient. The, the should be able to provide an account to the donor states to the U.S. Um, I don't believe that's happening. The U.S. has sent some uh, military advisors, which was uh, you know a euphemism often used in the Vietnam War, and the reason being was expressed as oh they're there to monitor these flows of of, of weapons and other equipment. That phrase and that usage of U.S. troops, military personnel on the ground, just makes me extremely nervous. For that reason, we saw what happened in Vietnam uh, year after year. Um, and I wonder if we're not seeing the same thing, history repeat itself. Do you cover Vietnam in your book? Uh, not directly. Uh, I'm certainly aware of it as sort of an amateur historian. I paid a lot of attention to it. One of the my favorite authors is Barbara Tuchman, and Barbara Tuchman wrote this book called The March of Folly. And I do reference that in my book because she uses Vietnam and other situations to just illustrate how governments time and time again take actions that they think are in their short-term interest, but that long-term are uh, it, it, not in their interest at all, or actually undermined to the nation. And uh, she uses Vietnam as one of the main examples just to describe how they knew, the US government, you know, four presidents, knew that the war was unwinnable, knew that this was going to end badly, but couldn't figure out a way out. They weren't willing to take a note, we never should have been here, and I hate to say it, but we see the same thing happening. And I do talk about this in my book, by the way. Uh, we jumped right into it, but my book is uh, Why America Matters. I don't know if you can see that there. Yeah, we'll, uh, we will make sure that we get the JPEG up. Absolutely. You can find it on whyamericamatters.com for everybody watching, listening. But what I, what, I, what I do point out a lot is if you look at the last 20 years in this country, you know, what we've come to call these the endless wars, and I describe it as America bees because there wasn't a war that we didn't, okay, so there wasn't an involvement where we didn't think we had a responsibility to get involved, whether it be Iraq, Iran, excuse me, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Syria, Libya, all these places around the world where it wasn't obvious in most cases what our strategic interests were, what our objectives were, or how we were ever going to succeed. You see a pattern here that is aimed or at least caused by the same political class having a set of ideas about what they want to accomplish that isn't necessarily related to anything that most Americans care about. So do you believe in this idea of the war machine? And I'll leave it at that. What I do believe is, sure, certain conflicts exist. What are some of the motivations right now? The U.S., I believe, has an underlying motivation in this war, which has to do with democracy or freedom for the Ukrainians. I think that the underlying objective, geopolitical objective of the U.S. government, the administration's actions right now, plants Russia as the leading provider of energy to Western Europe. I wrote and I expressed a view a couple of months ago that if you look at what happened with Nord Stream, the sabotage thereof, you can go through the potential. Russia had little motivation. That was their revenue uh, lifeline, their, their trump card in their negotiations with the West, the ability to turn on and turn off uh, the gas. There was no reason for them to blow up their own pipeline. As the West, in some form or fashion, the U.S. has the most to gain from it. And if you look at the whole U.S.'s engagement with Russia since the fall of the Berlin Wall and, and as the fall of the Soviet Union, it has been to keep Russia in a box, to keep them um, relatively powerless. And this is part and parcel with that. Listen, I'm very, I'm pro that America should be a strong nation, but I also believe that if we're stepping in some form of imperialism, that that will catch up with us. And so I think it's important that Americans are just aware 
there's a longer history uh, with started before February 2022. So for people who feel like they're not getting the full story about what's going on around the world, and as someone who is a historian who enjoys history, who's written about history, what do you suggest or where do you suggest people go to get their information? You and I can come to me. I think they'll get a lot of good stuff from uh, <laughs> between the two of us. So we'll we'll uh, we'll help sort it out. You know, I, but I really did you know write why American Matters for that reason because I, I realized and and I include this, that for many many years of sleep and for things that were going on, I only heard the news from main from the mainstream news, and it took me a while to realize that fake news was real and there was clearly a narrative that was not about truth finding anymore if journalism ever was it certainly isn't now it's about perpetuating a narrative and we can go into the details of what the narrative is but to your basic question i think americans have a duty to themselves and and to start to become more aware to start to pay attention i think us three years have uh, open the eyes of a lot of people. Consequence of both pandemic lockdowns, all the things that have gone on, and and some of the actions of the Biden administration have have been to wake. Some of this stuff is really happening. It isn't just a uh, conspiracy, uh, but there's there's a deeper deeper reality here. And um, so, get your check check the facts. Get your news from from alternative sources that are that are more about truth telling. My whole goal here. I don't have a political aspiration. My goal is to. Uh, inform and to uh, help educate and also to encourage the disheartened. Like, I feel like there are a lot of Americans who are so um, discouraged going on and don't really know what can be done. One of the biggest lessons that I, that we've learned, even over the past year, is just to see the effectiveness of parents who actually do get involved, Loudoun County schools, otherwise, we we had a couple decades there where we all just sort of sat back on our couches and just assumed that somebody else was going to do it for us, whether in our schools, in our communities, in the political process. And those days are over. We have to we have to wake up and and get involved ourselves. Absolutely. I'm not sure if you saw the remarks by Larry Fink the other day regarding populism, but basically he said the reason why we're experiencing inflation right now is because of populism. Your okay. thoughts. It's just science, first of all. I mean, keep in mind, you know, Larry Fink, incredibly successful multi-billionaire, founder of BlackRock, has a super large brain on the top of his body. But that idea is crazy, okay? Inflation is here for a couple of reasons. One, in my view, uh, out of control monetary policy, okay? We've crippled the US dollar, the quantity of US dollars that are floating around since the financial crisis. Okay, that's inflationary right there. We have in the Federal Reserve buy it because foreign, foreigners are no longer willing to buy uh, U.S. debt. In fact, I was just looking at a stat that in the last year, about a half a trillion dollars have been sold by foreigners, China, Japan, and other, others who are, who are scared of the future of the U.S. dollar. Now, inflation was a mo is a monetary problem, creating dollars out of thin air, stimulus programs where there's no productive value, we're just creating money. That is the real reason. People can call it whatever they want. Putin's price hike, you know, uh, lockdown, sorry, a deconfinement, opening opening up the economy. There are truths to all that. Obviously, supply chains were disrupted. To me, the bottom line here is we've had an out of control monetary policy. Um, when we went through the financial crisis, the U.S. government looked around, had no idea what to do. The one tool that they knew how to use very very easily, which was this big lever of quantitative easing, putting you know, push pushing money into the economy. And we are now beginning to pay the price for it. How bad is that or how painful is that price going to be over the next yeah. year? So the problem is you can either deal with inflation by killing it the way Volcker did in the in the 1980s, but that will likely result in a big jump in unemployment. So very bad for the economy for the recession. The other difference is when Reagan and Volcker faced a crisis, we weren't indebted the way we are today with debt at 130% of our gross domestic product. We don't have the financial flexibility to raise rates because even today at three or 4%, the national interest bill is going up and up and up above 5%. It starts to break the, the bank of the U.S. government. So the other way, and this is the way I've so the, the U.S. government and governments around the world, the only choice there they really have is to let inflation run, to talk as much as they want about we're going to be the inflation dragon slayer, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. We've got the Inflation Reduction Act, the worst named uh, bill I've seen. 
none of it is going to work. And in fact, they don't want it to work. The government wants, U.S. government and other governments want inflation to run because it devalues, uh, keep in mind that the U.S. government is the largest debtor uh, in this economy. So they want the dollar to devalue. And I would some who don't mind the resulting social instability because it forces, again, greater government. And you know, we'll, here, we'll solve your problem. We'll give you this stimulus check or otherwise. Populism is what is going to save this country from these very issues. When Americans start waking up and realizing what they're going to in the economy, in, in society, uh, it, it will be ordinary popular Americans who rise up and say enough. Enough is enough. Ordinary Americans. Well, thank you so much, Michael Wilkerson. I appreciate you speaking with us today, talking about thank SBF, you. but talking about the economy, politics, <laughs> you name it, you, you cover it all. I appreciate it, and I hope you'll come back. Absolutely. And again, Why America Matters at whyamericamatters.com. Great book, and it covers a lot of these issues. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate it. Thanks, Allison. See you next time. Take care.